You're watching The Sports Objective, the podcast for pirates. You're listening to Absolute Empowerment with Coach Jeff Connors on The Sports Objective. Join Coach C, the USA Strength and Conditioning Hall of Famer, every Monday night to see in a variety of guests, including former players, former and current coaches, pastors, and others will discuss relevant issues in coaching today's athlete with the goal of equipping the athlete and those coaching them with the physical, mental, and spiritual armor necessary to live their best life. Here's Coach Connors. Welcome to Absolute Empowerment. Uh, tonight we have another very special guest on the show, another uh, former ECU Pirate that I had the privilege and honor to coach, Big Ed Watkins, uh, former ECU Pirate, famed NASCAR Jackman and Gas Man, and now current owner of Ed Watkins Marine. Uh, welcome to the show, Big Ed. Coach, it's an absolute pleasure. It's an absolute honor. You've been a mentor of mine for my entire life, my entire adulthood. And I can't thank you enough for everything that you instilled in me in the mid 90s. Everything that you did from the mental toughness to those damn 110s and those 300s. I love you, coach. Well, I appreciate it. I enjoyed every moment of it. <clears throat> uh, so, Ed, what I want to talk to you a little bit about first is just a few characteristics that you, you've pretty much had through your whole life, I'm sure, but ones that were very beneficial to you through your collegiate career that anyone who knew you was very much aware of. And then I'm sure uh, those characteristics helped to carry you through your uh, career with NASCAR and actually what you're doing now. But uh, I always thought of you as a model of enthusiasm and positive spirit uh, an extremely loyal young man to the program and a loyal teammate, uh, very hard worker every day, and then a great ambassador to the program uh, while you were there and after you left. So uh, those, those characteristics uh, are very strong characteristics that contribute to a highly successful career, which you've had. So I want to compliment you on those and uh, recognize you for those. Coach, it's an honor, privilege, and I appreciate you very much. It's um, something that you instilled in us from day one, from the mental toughness, the mental fortitude, the chip on the shoulder that it took to be a pirate. When you knew that we took the field and when that fourth quarter came along, Coach, there was no questions in terms of who had the physical stamina, strength, and fortitude when the fourth quarter came around than us. And it was from the, the year-long dedication and the year-long commitment that we had with you from the in-season workouts. You know, those Sundays after we'd win a big game, we'd beat – you know, we'd beat Miami at Miami on ESPN and Orange Bowl Stadium. And Miami had just come off that big win against Florida State. You know, they're ranked top five in the country. And we just went right down to Orange Bowl Stadium and smacked them right in their ass. But you know what, Coach? We were on the practice fields that Sunday morning running those 300s, getting that daggum lactose out of our systems, running those 300s. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. There's nothing better than being an ECU Pirate in the 90s. It was because of you, Coach C. I love you, brother. You were the absolute fortitude of what made East Carolina University what it was. And we're the giant killers. And we were the giant killers because of you. And we appreciate you. Well, I certainly appreciate all that. And, you know, we ran those 300s on Sunday. The lactic acid had been long gone. But uh, what people don't realize is I was trying to actually produce moderate lactate in that. <clears throat> that basically, of course, helped circulation and repair the micro tears in the muscle. It was a great warm up. Our times weren't particularly fast. And it also served to actually 
promote growth hormones. So those were the, the reasons that I did that. Just wanted to clarify that. Coach C, I tell you and what. Lactose is a form of uh, milk, I believe, right? <laughs> hey, listen to me now. Coach C, we'd come back from that big top 25 win on ESPN highlights. It was in every sports bar in America. And I tell you what, I don't want a damn rag on the offensive lineman there in the, in the, in the mid-90s. But I, 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 think, I think we all had a sensation of uh, bush light and uh, beast light coming out of our pores. And there was nothing better than dag on hammering those 300s and flushing your system out after an all-night celebration of, uh, of winning and beating and, 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 and taking those power five teams down. You look back at East Carolina, you look back in your coaching days, Coach Connors, and look at the amount of power five schools we took down, we competed with, and we beat. And that's what put us into that category of being giant killers. And it was because of the, the year-round conditioning, everything we spoke of those, of those, uh, those Sunday morning 300s. But you think about, you know, on Tuesday we had the gassers. And then we had the winter conditioning in the off season. Yeah. And oh my God, I've never in my life have I thought of a 55 gallon rubber made trash can as I have. When I see one to this day, I still think of you and the entire physical conditioning program of winter conditioning at East Carolina University. And I respected that 55 gallon trash can and I vowed I would never come in contact with one and I never did, but I saw a lot of my teammates bow over on one of those. And then you go through spring conditioning and then summer conditioning. We had the one tens and the 16 one tens and holy smokes, coach. We, like I said, we started to show off coach. When we got into the fourth quarter, we knew there was no, if it was Miami, Virginia tech, South Carolina, good Lord, look at all those top five schools that we were talking about in the Power Five. If we knew we were in the fourth quarter, those schools were not going to be any more prepared than we were because of you. Well, I always appreciated the hard work, the attitude, the leadership of, of those teams. We we talk about that uh, 10 years so much. I mean, it's uh, – and because, and the reason we talk about it is because we average five power five schools at least on the schedule, like almost every year. And, uh, you know, and that was, uh, it was a giant killer chip on your shoulder mentality at ECU, something I really related well to. And uh, you guys bought into whatever I, <clears throat> I threw out there for you. And, uh, you know, we played. During that 10-year period that I was there, we played 51 Power 5 schools, and we won 26 of those games. So, wow. you know, when uh, when the Pirates rolled out there, you could count on them winning half of those games. And, uh, you know, I thought that was, uh, uh, you know, a tremendous characteristic for the program. And w when you look at the resources that we had and the fact that, you know, we brought in a lot of, Two star guys, maybe maybe a few three star guys here and there, and we had to we had to basically find a way to put a few few more stars on those guys by the time, <laughs> by the time we rolled out there, you know. So uh, you know, uh, the training was was extremely important. Um, what I want to talk to you a little bit about it is uh, I'd, I'd love to know more about young Ed Watkins. Um, a little bit about your hometown, the the influences in your life, uh, your high school athletic career, you know, how you ended up at ECU. And <clears throat> a big part of this show, Ed, is, as you know, I think you realize is I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to uh, highlight a testimony of faith every time that I can with everyone that I've had on this show. Um, overcoming adversity through faith, anything like that that you experienced growing up. Love to hear about that, but uh, love to hear more about Young Ed. Well, Coach, Young Ed, I tell you what, um, he he was a uh, 
seemed like he was a hardworking but not accomplishing individual. School was always tough. And for everything that had to get done, it seemed like the young Ed had to work 10 times harder than, than, than his peers. And that was a huge, tremendous disadvantage at the time. But looking back at it, it really instilled a hard work value. It really did. It uh, instilled a lot of uh, make me humble, made me appreciative and made me hungry. And from high school, playing baseball, basketball and football and excelling in all three sports, I always knew football was my bread and butter. I love the game of football. There's nothing better than high school football Friday night when you got those bands, you got the you got that sound, you got that smell in the air. And then when you're in the locker room and you, you, you cinch that chin strap up, coach, you know, there's just no, no feeling any better than high school football Friday night. And I tried to do my best and represent a struggling high school, a high school that got very little exposure. Uh, it was a baseball school, in all honesty. We, we, we made it to the state championships every year in baseball. But when it came to football, we just didn't have the team. And that basically took me to a year in West Virginia uh, through basic, you know, struggles in high school. Um, I had to go to a school in, in, in West Virginia. Uh, as we passed in through into, into college, I went for a year in Concord College and um, basically gained that exposure, got that exposure that I did not have in high school. Got that exposure playing defensive line in Concord College up in in Aspen, uh, Athens, West Virginia. And I always had that East Carolina University. I had always had ECU circled on my, on my perspective, on my periscope. And one thing led to the next. I ended up at ECU after a really, really good year of freshman football at a D2 school that I spoke of, um, uh, Concord College. Ended up at, at – uh, uh, ECU and walked in, God, first of June, my first day in the weight room, I opened the door and I looked around and I said, holy smokes. I said, these guys ain't too bad, but I love the excitement of that strength coach. And let me tell you about that strength coach that I met at ECU the very first minute, the very first second of the time. He was a daggone fired up absolute tenacious individual that left all his emotions on the line. He wouldn't let anybody cut corners. He wouldn't anybody show up late. And I absolutely valued his transparency 100%. And from the very first minute, the very first second, the time I walked into the weight room at East Carolina university in 1994 coach, you fell into my heart. I valued your values and I valued you very much. And you're a huge part, not only as my number one mentor in life, but you've become a huge part in terms of my stamina in life. Um, and that was 1994, the very first second of the day I walked into the weight room at ECU was June of 94. And from that point on, I knew I, was going to lay my heart out, my soul out. And I knew that you were going to take us to areas that people just didn't expect to be able to take. And I said, Coach Connors is the man that can take a, exactly like he said, it can take a two-star athlete and make them into a four-star athlete. It can just make it, make it happen and always just do the right things right. And that's what we did. And next thing I know, I'm in, my final destination of making it to East Carolina University, being a pirate and being a part of uh, the ECU football program and could not think of a better place to be that uh, ECU in the, in the 1990s. Unreal. Well, again, Ed, much appreciated. And I, I don't know if you, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, but, you know, I played at Salem, West Virginia. And by the time you got there, uh, I don't think Salem was in the conference uh, 
And but you know, I played in that conference where you played. We played Shepherd, we conquered. Yeah. And I played at Concord a couple times. And uh, so uh, you know, the WVIAC was real, some really good football. And yeah. uh, we had uh, you know a few guys that, uh, of course, got drafted in, off of my team when I was there. We had kind of like a lot of uh, transfer renegades to my school, <laughs> but uh, but I really enjoyed playing in that conference. And Concord always had a good football team, um, so uh, very familiar with that. So. Um, you know, your experience at ECU, obviously, for both of us, included some of the best all-time, you know, wins there. And, uh, you know, how do you think that you're – beyond your experience with me, uh, how do you think your experience there strengthened you uh, – I guess strengthened the person that you already were? Uh, what are some of your experiences there and, you know, some of the other people that you were uh, – that influenced you? and some of the, maybe the friendships that you made, uh, how, how did that influence you and uh, help you in the future? Well, I tell you what, Coach, it's um, couldn't have had a better place to be, could have had a better coaching staff, couldn't have any more appreciation to you and to what you have done and what you did for the program. But um, good Lord, you know, we speak of those uh, – once, once we got to ECU, baby, it was game on. It was game on. I knew I was at the place that I wanted to be. I had home in my heart, and I had daggone freaking intestinal fortitude looking forward to me. Every day I would see you, you would light my ass up, and you'd get me to the promised land. And you carry, you know, Jamie Gray, Ronnie Sutter, Shane McPherson, Danny Moore, you would piggyback those guys and carry them. And we did stadiums. We did stadiums during the summertime. And you carried them guys to the very top of the stadium. And your quads were blowing up, but you still had more to go. And every time, it was just unreal. From year round, I wouldn't have had a better place to be. From in-season, off-season, spring conditioning, spring football, to summer conditioning, it by far was the most incredible experience I ever had in my life was being a football player at East Carolina University is because of you and the success and the wins that we had was because of you. But a lot of that gets instilled into you. You're, you're, a, you're a very impressionable person when you're in your early 20s. And you learn how quick, you know, mental fortitude, mental toughness, Coach, if there's some, if I go onto Wikipedia right now and I was to type in on Wikipedia, mental toughness, Coach Connors, Coach C would be at the highlight of the definition of, of mental toughness on Wikipedia. And I love you for that, Coach, because you made things happen. You made, you made, Small people be large. You made weak become strong. And not only did it pertain and win and, and, and gain its value in terms of the years of being at ECU, but it also instilled that in lifetime accomplishments for every player that you touched. Every player that you touched, Coach, you have left – a lasting lifetime accomplishment on. And I'm one of them. And I can't thank you enough, but it's through those values and all that that you encompassed on us that allows me to win in life, win in the business world, and more specifically win in the boating industry is taking that is being a giant killer. I've come in my first seven years. I bought a small boat dealership that had one boat brand and one engine brand. And within seven years, I've got a multi-location, eight 
boat brand business representing Suzuki, Mercury, Yamaha, C Pro boats, Stingray boats, G3, G3 Suncatcher pontoons, Vexus, Ranger boats. We're representing the very best boat brands on the water in just seven years at a multi-location facility. We have tripled in revenue sales. I've got, golly, I've got employees that, um, you know, we're, we're a 20 plus employee facility and we're, we're growing. We're growing positively and we're growing by doing the right things right and everything, my core values of my business life, my business pers business perspective has come from those early days at ECU. And it's hard to, it's hard to believe that business decisions can come from running 300s. It's hard to believe that business decisions can come from running 110s, but it's the mental toughness, the mental fortitude, and that winning tradition that was instilled in us at an early time that uh, that allows that to happen, Coach, and I couldn't thank you enough. Well, I'm very f thankful for the opportunity to be able to coach at ECU and uh, <clears throat> during both times that I was there. But, uh, you know, Henry Van Sant, one of our administrators way back when, uh, who I really respected a lot, he once told me, you know, we're just – we're stewards of this place. It'll be here a lot longer than us, and, uh, and that's the truth. So we uh, – contribute what we can uh, to the future of the program, the tradition of the program, and also the culture of the program, which, uh, you know, when new coaches come in, they always talk about changing the culture. And, and my thing with ECU was, you know, if we, if we weren't successful for a number of years, you know, here and there, then, you know, you can, you can bring in a new regime, but you might have to recapture the culture, but I don't think you really have to change the culture and change the tradition of ECU because it's very deep. And uh, I always appreciated that and appreciated the opportunity to uh, to coach every day that I was here. And I also very much appreciated the head coaches that I worked for, whether they were uh, – some of them were highly successful and uh, – you know, uh, one of them wasn't greatly successful, but you know, when you, when you're in the Division One, <clears throat> in Division One athletics, uh, you sometimes you know things don't go exactly the way you plan them at times, and uh, you know that that happens across the country. But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your um, experience uh, with NASCAR. Of course, I don't know a whole lot about NASCAR, but <laughs> Walter Williams took me to uh, Rockingham one time. I, I, you know, I always loved Walter. You know, he was a <laughs> huge uh, ECU, you know, basically kind of built athletics at ECU, really. Um, so I was there, and I, I came down uh, in the beginning – uh, where all the noise was. And then I guess, you know, we sat up in the VIP place the rest of the race. I was, I was trying to understand it a little bit, but uh, uh, you had started as a Jack man, a guy named Ray Evernham got you into, into it. you, uh, the way that it's, it's explained is you started to knock on doors, which didn't surprise me, you know, and uh, say, Hey, I'm here. I want to be a Jack man. I'll be the best Jack man you ever saw in your life. And uh, who wants me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming that's kind of how it went. That's right. You want some, come and get some. That's exactly right, Coach. Yeah, it, um, it started in 1997. My, uh, my eligibility for football had, had uh, come to completion. And... Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm big on visual check marks. And in my life, I had college football and I had, and I had NASCAR pit crew and daggone if I didn't have the boating industry. Those three things I had as check marks in my life since I was about five years old. Yeah. And um, couldn't have 
had a better experience, couldn't have had a better coaching staff, couldn't have had a better winning opportunity than we did at ECU, Coach. And, uh, you know, as you know, one chapter closes, another chapter opens. Right. And uh, the NASCAR chapter became, and holy smokes, now it was game on. It was game on, baby. Look out, because Big Ed is heading to NASCAR. This is something I wanted to do. This was something I wanted to do for a long time. My God, I'm going to dig on getting in NASCAR and rock and roll. In 1997, I just started basically knocking on doors and went from door to door to door. I can remember all the race shops and all the race teams that I went to. You know, as you can imagine, being a young strength coach, all the all the door knocking you had to do, Coach C, in terms of what you had to do to be able to be able to find a home. And I was big Ed, and I wanted to go find a home in NASCAR. And I started off with the top man. I started off with the big man. I started off with the most winningest team in all of NASCAR. Hendrick Motorsports, the number 24 DuPont car, Jeff Gordon and Ray Evernham. Ray Evernham was his crew chief. And I went straight there. And I started knocking on his door. And um, his door didn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold, he was out in the holler running a chassis dyno, or excuse me, running a shock dyno on a set of shocks. And I went into the holler, went into the truck, and I said, Mr. Neverham, I said, my name's Ed Watkins. I just finished up football at East Carolina University. I want to be part of your pit crew program. And he swung around and looked at me. And he said, son, he said, Mr. Everham is my dad, but you can call me Ray. And I said, all right. I said, we got something going on here. And uh, from that point on, he started judging me, gauging me, feeling me out, pre-qualifying me. And I must have hit all the criteria that he was looking for because he invited me back for pit practice, which was the next day. Problem is, I was still at ECU. My football eligibility had finished, and I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's four hours, almost four hours of time between Charlotte to Greenville, and then four hours from Greenville back to Charlotte. So I ended up sleeping in my Ford Bronco that night at Hendrick Motorsports, just so I could follow back up with him and the pit crew coach. And one thing led to the other. They started their, uh, what they called was, was basically, a lot of you guys know is the Rainbow Warriors. And yeah. I was one of the first uh, members of the Rainbow Warriors and Jeff Gordon's pit crew. I started in 1997, and I couldn't thank uh, Ray Everham enough. Ray Everham... A lot like you, Coach, had a lot of incredible things that he possessed and a lot of qualities that, that I really, really liked. And um, I'm a very loyal individual. And I tell you, once I get hold of somebody that I like, look out because I'm freaking, I'm like a damn uh, big old bulldog, man. I'm freaking right on you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm white on rice. I'm your shadow. Once I like you, you ain't getting rid of me. You can damn kick me. You can slap me. But if I like you, I'm right there on you. And that's the way it was. So from Coach Connors at ECU, I went right into Ray Everham in NASCAR with Jeff Gordon. And God, mighty son, we ended up winning an ungodly amount of races in 1997, 1998. Uh, part of the uh, the backup crew with him went in to become uh, part of his main crew there in the late 90s uh, on the 24 car and then transitioned all of a sudden you know Ray became such a uh, a focal point of of winning and such a focal point of success Dodge came on board and they cherry picked Ray to lead. The, uh, the Dodge manufacturers 
um, association in the, in the, um, in the NASCAR. And I was personally asked by Ray Everham to be a part of his race team when he started Everham Motorsports with the Dodge dealers, UAW Dodge with, um, golly, Bill Elliott, Casey Atwood, Jeremy Mayfield, Casey Kane, and ran for that for about 10 years and uh, started his pit crews. I was able to be a part of the very first hire for his pit crew and not only be a very first hire for his pit crew, but also assemble and oversee the development of the entire pit crew for Everham Motorsports and be a part of that operation and see it become, you know, the staple of what it became. And next thing I know, good Lord, that was 1997. And 25 years later, I was on a top tier, fully funded championship capable winning team every year. And there is not an absolute soul on pit road that can say that they competed in NASCAR's highest level for 25 years on a championship caliper team. So I started in 97 with Jeff Gordon, and I finished up with Denny Hamlin in the late, uh, in, in, in 22. It was Michael Jordan on his team. And every year of those 25 years, good Lord, 54 cup, NASCAR cup wins, 54 NASCAR cup wins, three Daytona 500s, and three championships. And to this day, there's no one that can walk on pit road with accolades of what I accomplished. And I hold that very near and dear to my heart. But it all came from hard work. And it all came from the values and the buy-in that you taught us in the 1990s at East Carolina University, Coach. And that's another reason why I love you, brother. <laughs> Well, you had a great career, and I do love that story about how you went knocking on doors because uh, I was at Bucknell getting my uh, master's degree, and and I was coaching, and uh, you know I went down to the Philadelphia Eagles and started knocking on their door, and you know I got to know uh, Ronnie Jones, the strength coach there. He thought I was about half crazy. You know, he didn't know me from Adam. I had called him first and asked him if I could come down. He had to go, <clears throat> excuse me, go meet with Buddy Ryan. So I about tore his office apart just trying to find out what he had in there. But he told me, hey, whatever you want to see, go ahead and open some drawers and start looking and so forth. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it because Ronnie was friends with Steve Logan, and that's how I ended up at East Carolina. But if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have uh, ever been at East Carolina. You know, so uh, – that's what you got to do, man. You got to go get it. And, hey, if they don't, uh, if, hey, coach, if they don't open, just kick them in, big dog. That's right. Kick them in, man. Kick them in, brother. So proud of you for doing that. And uh, great example for anybody out there that wants to be successful. You know, you got to go get it, man. So uh, you also were, were was with uh, Martin Truex Jr., right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> 2017. Martin Truex Jr. on the number 78 Bass Pro Shop Toyota. And uh, good Lord, son, we ended up winning like 10, 11 races that year. Uh, 19 to 20 um, stage wins. I tell you what, Coach, we'd show up at the racetrack. We were the hottest damn thing known to mankind. We'd <laughs> show up. We'd sit on the pole. We'd lead every damn lap of the race, and we'd win that son of a bitch. And we just terrorized the 2017 season, won the, won the championship that year, kicked ass, and had a damn good time doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. All right, so, uh, you know, when you won the Daytona 500. Uh, yeah. We won that on fuel mileage thanks to the damn gas man that the number 11 car had that year. <laughs> love it, man. Love it. How many people were in the stands? 253,948. <laughs> Top 
TV ratings on the biggest damn Fox broadcast of all time. And there's Big Ed in the damn infield holding the damn race winning driver in his shoulder because he done won that son bitch on fuel mileage. Love it, man. Love it. <laughs> Can't imagine 250,000 people in the stadium. I mean, I was man. wide open, baby. It was, was wide, wide open. open brother. That's awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah, congratulations again on that. Uh, so, you know, I coached in three bowl games in uh, Charlotte uh, when I was in Carolina. I had two Meineke Bowls, and I don't even know what the other one was called, Car Quest. I was there for every one, Coach. Gotcha. <laughs> and uh, I'm supporting you. Well, I appreciate that, even though I was at that other place. Yes. Um, so, but we love uh, you. <laughs> I, they one of the activities was you could get in one of those cars with one of the drivers and go around the track three times. I only did it one time because that was enough experience for me to go 180 miles an hour, two feet from the wall. I said, "Yeah, I get it," but let me tell you something. I I learned that, you know, I, I gained an unbelievable level of respect for those guys. I have no clue how you could do that for as long as they do it. I mean, uh, I, I, how do you even train for that? I mean, how do you get used to going that fast for that long and focus that hard for that long? Well, what that's, the, what, that's what, the easy well, part. Okay. The hard part's on pit road. I got you. When you got, listen to me, coach. When you're up on pit road and you know when i started we didn't have helmets we barely had fire suits but you would get up on that wall the daytona 500 that'd be 200,000 people in the grandstands it'd be the most viewed tv audience of the entire racing season on tv we'd have cbs watching and you knew Nothing like standing up on the wall and all of a sudden that big TV, that big TV camera comes right in front of you. And all of a sudden, you see 200,000 people in front of you, 100,000 people behind you. That was just NASCAR's prime. That was back in the days when build a grandstand, they would come. You had Dale Earnhardt, Sterling Marlin, Daryl Walsh. You had them all. You had the greatest ones, Rusty Wallace, Mark Martin. And all of a sudden, that was when pit road opened back then was when the real dog fight started next all of a sudden you come down you would get up on that wall and that come then cars would start coming down on pit road and it'd be like a cold chill I'd be like holy smokes here we go baby it's game on brother you had 43 cars coming at you at interstate highway speed the national broadcast stations, the CBS, ESPN, Fox, had their big boom cameras in front of you. And you knew it was game on, big boy. You knew it was game on. And them cars come in, you could see the brake rotors glowing cherry red. And back then, we didn't have all them sissy rules that they have nowadays. Back then, you would have to be basically on an island fitting for yourself so as a jack man back in the early 2000s i'd have to lay my tire out on pit road so rusty wallace or mark martin wouldn't run me over but uh it was unreal you know being a part of the you know 2001 daytona 500 we were pitted beside dale earnhardt the very year where um where he went into turn three and turn four coming to the checkered flag and he got right reared by sterling marlin i was right there in his pits right beside him watching all that happen as we were pitting for the number nine car and i tell you what coach back in in 2000s the early 2000s nascar there was nothing any better than being a part of that program it really was and it was, uh, yeah, we get it uh, to Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Brickyard 400. You have four or 500,000 people. I never in my life have ever seen four or 500,000 people in one place, but you would there at Bristol Motor Speedway. 
you'd have 165,000 people in Bristol Motor Speedway. And if you didn't have a basically a, um, you know, a, a, a ticket that was inherited from you to be able to get in, you weren't getting into that place. If you, you, there was an absolutely untouchable feeling to be a part of being in Bristol Motor Speedway and being a part of those races in the early 2000s. It was a honor and privilege. It's unreal to be a part of that. It really was. Gotcha, man. Sounds like an incredible experience. You got my heart rate up just talking about it, brother. <laughs> Interstate <laughs> highway speeds. We got race cars coming at you. At 60 miles an hour, Dale Earnhardt, Rusty Wallace, Mark Martin, Dale Earnhardt. And I tell you what, man, it was a dog fight there on pit road. It was an absolute dog fight. And back then, those guys, you know, all of us back then, we had freaking clout on pit road. When you survived and you made years on pit road, you developed clout because it was earned. It was a blast. Yeah. Well, I also wanted to, uh, you know, mention the fact that I, I would have people from NASCAR come to my office a couple times a year recruiting folks, recruiting athletes uh, for, you know, gas man, jack man, whatever the other positions are that required some physicality, you know, that required some strength, of course, and uh, some of the same attributes that football players have, size and strength. And... Uh, so I'm assuming that there were a lot of parallels there with regard to practice and execution, execution in minimal time, uh, the competitive spirit, uh, the team concept and having a game plan. And then, you know, uh, also the physical preparation where, you know, you still probably had to be in the weight room and had to be in some kind of shape to be able to do this, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I tell you what, from my days at ECU with Coach Connors, when I had to go on pit road and perform, and then I had to perform in a weight room, it was nothing compared to what I had going on and all the mental fortitude, mental toughness that you'd established throughout all those years. But um, I'm telling you, there's nothing more, uh, there's nothing more humbling than being on pit wall in the Daytona 500 and CBS is covering it and you've got live cameras in front of you. The cars are coming down at you at interstate highway speeds and you're going to basically determine the outcome of this race. And for 25 years, I put my driver out front every time I had that opportunity to make a definite decision and a definite program of positive movement on pit road and we won every time we won with the daytona 500 with denny hamlin multiple times we won with ungodly amounts of fuel mileage races with denny hamlin at pocono because i was able to get more fuel in the car faster than anybody else on pit road and it comes down to who is going to stay late, who's going to be in that race shop, and who's going to work harder than anybody else to make yourself perform on Sunday afternoon. And that was me in my position. And that's where I took all that, 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 that old school feeling of when I was always in elementary school, always having to work harder to just perform to my colleagues, well, I took it in NASCAR to being able to work harder and excel. And it worked out really well for 25 years. And my God, you got three Daytona 500s, three, three Daytona 500s, three championships and 54 cup wins. And good Lord, I couldn't have, I couldn't have left anything else on the table back then. Now, when the young guys came in and started <clears throat> With those positions, uh, did you have an opportunity to coach them? Did you have an opportunity to train them? Did you do a lot of that? You did, and I did, because you spoke on that a lot. I was the groundbreaker of 
the college football player going in NASCAR. Yeah. And through my success and what I was able to do, basically open the door for the college recruiting that you started having where you had these NASCAR teams coming to college strength coaches and colleges recruiting people because they saw how valuable and how successful when you had someone that was geared for pit crew, how good that would be for a race team. And that's basically where it became was from the late nineties, you had your uh, mechanics and your guys that were geared just for the race car. And you had your specialty guys just geared for pit crew stuff. And that's where I came into was the late nineties. And then all of a sudden just took off from that point on to the success of, holy shit, look at what big Ed's doing on pit road. I've got to get more of him. And next thing you know, you got Hendrick motorsports, Joe Gibbs racing, Roush racing, Penske going to every major college in America looking for more big Ed's because I kicked their ass and I freaking made it happen for 25 years. In 25 years, holy smokes, look at the damn accolades, accomplishments, the wins, the championships, the Daytona 500s. Good Lord. It was a damn dream come true, Coach. I love it, baby. Now, uh, our good buddy Jeff Carr did pretty well, too, in NASCAR, right? Jeff Carr is my damn boy. Big Wood. Big Wood's the way we referred to him in the late 90s. I was a senior at ECU. And uh, Jeff Carr slash Big Wood came on as a freshman from China Grove, North Carolina. And, Coach, we'd have those walkthrough times. And those walkthrough times were very valuable. But we still have our helmets on, but we wouldn't have any pads. And those walk you those walkthrough times for value because it gave you a chance to get reps, but you weren't hitting. Yeah. The next thing you know, had this had this young boy, Jeff Carr from China Grove, North Carolina, that all of a sudden strapped it up. And on those walkthroughs, all of a sudden set hut, boom! He'd blow you up. He would blow you up. He did not know the meaning of half speed. And the next thing you know, I was snapping the ball, and this boy was coming at me at 100%, 100% wide ass open. Bam! Smacking me right in the face mask. And I was like, damn! I was like, this boy's bringing the wood. And from that point on, that's when we ended up nicknaming him Wood. Yeah. Because he brought the wood every time. If it was just walkthroughs or full tilt, he was bringing the wood. I've never met an individual, mm -hmm. Coach C. To this day, me and me and Jeff Carr, we embrace, we fish, we love, we just, we just bond. And to this day, I see those gouges underneath his eyebrow from his very first year, his freshman year at ECU, from when he was just bringing the wood every time. We'd be half throttle just in walkthroughs, but you'd snap that ball and he would just bring it 100% and just light you up. But Jeff did a tremendous job in NASCAR. He was a jack man. He made me proud. He was he was one of my mentors. He was he was one of my my boys. He was a few years younger than me and he freaking lit it up. He did a fantastic job. I love the guy. Good Lord, what the impact that he did for EC football, yeah, and um, and for NASCAR, but uh, God, you talking about somebody that brought it every time, every snap, led with his head and just brought it, brought the intensity, brought the power every time. I love that guy. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah, he definitely one of the most physical players that I had the opportunity to coach and still uh, talk to Jeff quite a bit myself. Um, he's uh, got some kids now that are doing very well athletically also. 
so, you know, and I had he and his uh, wife, of course, Misty on, on the uh, podcast as well. And that was a great one. Fantastic. Um, great so, combination. Yeah. So, you know, tell me a little bit about the type of boats that you sell. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know anything. I don't know much about boats. I know, I know uh, the, everybody says, Hey, boat, break out another thousand. I'll, I'll use somebody else's, you know, because it's so expensive to have a boat, but uh, <clears throat> I have had some experiences when I was coaching in Florida. Uh, I had the Nicholas kids in school and they had a big uh, fishing boat. We went out caught a big marlin one day I, I was catching bonita and i thought the bonita were really you know they would fight you and they were big fish and then we started using them for bait so uh you know i got some learning experiences down there in the ocean when i was uh, co you know coaching high school in florida a long time ago but i don't like those seven foot seas at all so uh, uh i like the intercoastal so you know the boat i like is is that little two-seater teak wood boat my wife likes that. I said, man, well, let's get one of those. Then I found out they cost about a thousand, $100,000 for a little teak wood boat, right? Coach C, I got a boat for you, big man. I tell right. you what, don't you worry one bit. I'm guaranteed to put a smile on your face. <laughs> All right. There's nothing better than being on the water. Yeah. And I tell you what, you go onto my website, edwatkinsmarine.com we got seven of the nation's leading boat builders we got the very best center consoles we got the very best pontoons we got the very best bay boats center consoles bass boats fishing boats you name it yeah with the very best engines on the back of it New, used, I've got, Coach C, I've got like over 130 boats in stock at two locations. It's nothing better than being on the water. You're a you're an Emerald Isle guy. You're in Atlantic Beach, Moorhead City. I got a house at Emerald Isle. Yep. There's nothing better than being at Emerald Isle. Atlantic Beach, that Moorhead City area. Especially this time of the year when the fish bite is on. Then to be on the water when that sun is rising, when that sun is coming across that Atlantic Ocean, and you've got your own personal bay boat, center console, what have you, and you're going out saying, let's go out of Moorhead City. We're going to go out of Moorhead City. And we're running out past through there. We're going past the knuckle. We're headed... We're headed towards, let's head out towards, uh, good Lord, the ocean front of, of, of everything that's out there. And man, I tell you what, Coach C, it's uh, with, look on our website between the C-Pro 273, the C-Pro 269, the, um, the 259, the 320, that market is absolutely took off. Yeah. And it's unreal when that sun's coming up and you're headed out of Moorhead City, headed out to the ocean. And, you know, there's all kinds of markers out there. There's all kinds of shipwrecks out there. But just running up and down the intercoastal waterway, it's uh, that, that saltwater boat has really taken off. Yeah. The center console sea pros have taken off. The 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 stingray uh, saltwater boats have taken off. It's there's nothing better than having a boat that can be a family boat one day and a hardcore fishing boat the very next. And you know it better than I do. Those waters down where you're at at Emerald Isle and Atlantic Beach and Moorhead City. And good God Almighty. There's a reason why Michael Jordan is bringing Catch-23, which is a 90-foot Viking, when he's bringing it into Moorhead Sea to fish that big old offshore tournament there in uh, the 1st of June. And uh, good God, man, I'm telling you, I'll absolutely love it. There's nothing better than being on the water. We got everything from a from a 15-foot to a 34-foot fishing boat. We've got family premier family um pontoon boats center consoles uh 
it's just it's just it's just there's no reason why not to own a boat nowadays it really is between where i'm at in lake norman we got multi locations we're on the east coast on the west coast of lake norman on the east coast of lake norman i'm down in your neck of the woods in eastern north carolina i've even become I've even become a student at Carteret County Community College just to start their captain certification just because I love Moorhead City so much and I can't wait to breathe the salt air down when I'm down there. I love that salt air. I love the seagulls. I love Emerald Isle. I love Atlantic Beach. So I became a student at Carteret County Community College just to be able to get my daggum captain certification. I love it. So between Lake Norman, Eastern North Carolina, Big Ed is running hard. He's covering the real estate. And I love making Pirate Nation my home. I love making Pirate Nation the home for Ed Watkins Marine. I'll hand deliver any boat that you need. And I tell you what, Coach C, there's nothing better than being on the water on a center console bay boat or a deep V because the fishing's wide open, springtime is here, and there's nothing better than life and life on the water, baby. I love it. Well, it's a couple things. You know, when I lived in Moorhead City, I had a house down there too when I was in Carolina, and uh, went out with some friends occasionally in a boat. And you know, uh, you'd be running. There'd be about like six, eight inches of water out there. And uh, every once in a while, people get stuck on a sandbar. I'm like, and I don't want no part of that. Because what's going to happen if I get stuck out here? So the depth of the water uh, is something I would have to learn. And I never backed the boat into the water. I'm afraid I just back my whole truck into the into the intercoastal. But I do have a Toyota Tundra TRD Pro, which is a pretty good truck to haul anything. But uh, those would be the things that you would have to teach me, brother. I'm going to teach you right now, Coach C. Put on your Toyota TRD. It's a very fine pickup truck. It can pull. It can pull ninety percent of the boats that I have in stock right here at Ed yeah. Watkins Marine. Put your hand at six o'clock on the steering wheel. Here we go. One oh one. Within ten seconds or less. Put your hand on the steering wheel at six o'clock. If you need your boat to go left, you turn the steering wheel to go left. You need your boat to go right. You turn your steering wheel to go right. Always put your hand at the six o'clock position. That's your frame of reference. And from that point on, I'll get you dialed in with any boat that you need, Coach C. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Can't wait. Hey, uh, so, uh, Ed, we got to close it here soon. So tell me about your family, brother. Hey, we're hanging. We're doing good. Uh, I got a daughter that's in eighth grade that's kicking butt in volleyball. It's doing a tremendous job, and she just won her team. She's on a travel ball team up here in Hickory, North Carolina. She has won the team last week on a big overhand slam on the top net. She did a fantastic job. I got a son that's a race car driver, and he's a lacrosse player, and he's a football player, and he loves it, baby. He's just staying hungry. He's in seventh grade. And they are growing hard, doing well. And I couldn't be any more proud of Avalyn Watkins, my daughter, and Rylan Watkins, my son. And life is good, brother. And life is good. Well, that's really great to hear. And uh, we're going to have to, to bring this uh, session to a close here. But I can't wait to talk to you again. And uh, I really want to get down to where that, uh, you know, one of – one of those stores where you you're selling those boats and take a look around a little bit. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I got to get there one of these days. All a pirate nation, baby. Come to me, come to me. All a pirate nation. We got friends and family discount and we got purple and gold discount. We name it from Charlotte, North Carolina of Lake Norman to Emerald Isle, Atlantic beach, Moorhead city, babe. We got all state of North Carolina covered. Love Pirate Nation. Love you, Coach C. Got you covered, big man. I, I appreciate it, man. You keep looking around for that two-seater, that nice little wooden boat for me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great to have you on. We'll be talking sometime soon. 
Stay fired up, brother. Stay fired up. You have a happy Easter and give your kids a hug for me. Absolutely, Coach Connors. I love you. I appreciate you. Go Pirate Nation. I couldn't be more privileged to be a part of the show. Okay, take care. This is Jeff Connors uh, signing off for Absolute Empowerment. We'll see you next week, and God bless. Thank you very much, Ed.